I welcome Katie Massey. Oh, somebody's back. <laughs> That's a real relief. I thought you were all going to go. Um, I was going to say a little bit about Tangled Roads, which I'm going to read from, but sure you've covered it, so thank you. Uh, it is also for sale. Um, I, the piece I'm going to read is uh, a piece of memoir, my own memoir. It's about my absent father. And in a sense, it's a bit of an experiment. It was a bit of an experiment to find out if I could write about something that isn't there. Um, a quality of memory that is really, really indistinct. Um, there's no accents and no sex, so please bear with me. Uh, <laughs> you set the bar pretty high there, don't you? Um, I, also, this notion about absent fathers has kept turning up throughout the day. I've been in various different sessions, and it it keeps... I thought it wasn't going to fit in very much, but there, there we all are, talking about the men who are not present, present company accepted, you two. So, um, yes, I should... I should uh, just dedicate this to all the men that are not in the room with us. <laughs> a group of intelligent women, what could possibly scare them? Uh, <laughs> well, I'll just get on with it, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's called Stories Our Parents Tell Us. My father, Cyril Anglin, was born, I think, in Kingston, Jamaica, and I'm told he manned US submarines during the Second World War. But why did he come to Britain, and for what? True, he came at a time when joining the Windward Rush East was an opportunity for young, single West Indian men. But this information is not enough, it just doesn't cover it. He was not so young anyway, and he almost certainly wasn't single. Also, my memories of him may be sparse, pathetic shards of knowledge, not fit for the purpose of written recollection, but they are of a small, dapper man. A dapper man who, with a fully developed sense of his own importance, I feel sure wouldn't have been seen dead driving a bus or checking a tube ticket. And he was not poor either, or so he said, because he had land in Jamaica and work in America. So I have no idea what my daddy was doing in England, only that perhaps his brothers came here too and that they all lived in London. So I hardly knew him, but I have a small collection of memories which I keep safely wrapped in my subconscious to emerge in dreams or when I am poor with a bad cold or sometimes when friends talk about their fathers. Because my friends and I are now firmly middle-aged, they talk about once tightened men who are now grown old and become bad-tempered and smaller, some almost babyish. My father never ages. These memories or rather bits of memories, for they are not even complete stories, embarrass me. Like a childhood collection of bus tickets or sea glass rediscovered in the corner of a loft. I am aware that these memories, like those out of date bits of card and smooth bits of glass, resemble nothing more than rubbish when stripped of the passion that brought them together in the first place. But though what I can recall is paltry, I have poured a daughter's hopeless love into their careful storage, storage away from the harsh, fact-filled light of day. I remember the feel of his hair, the tight curls sparsely distributed over his smooth, dark mahogany skull. I can see my infant hand reaching out in front of my face to touch this hair. I had never experienced a texture like it. It was rough like sandpaper, much rougher than my hair, even though it was the same colour. But press a little harder, and it was soft and springy as well, like mam's sheepskin rug when I buried my hand properly in, past the surface candy floss, down to the tightly packed hair nearest the hide. Mam stood in for him, my pale, pump, blue-eyed mam, who brought me and my brothers up on her own, but who never quite made the grade. I have forgotten a thousand of Mam's everyday kindnesses, but I can recall in vivid Technicolor a pair of bell-bottom trousers Dad bought me when I must have been about five years old. They were purple corduroy, with triangular panels of purple floral fabric near the bottom, which meant that the trousers flared out in a satisfyingly swingy way. He also bought me a blouse that matched the floral panels and which tied at my waist, revealing an inch or so of pudgy brown flesh. Sashaying down our lead street, I thought I looked like Latoya or Janet of the Jacksons. I didn't. 
I have a couple of other memories. I once stayed with him and auntie in London. Hortense was one of those large, traditionally built women whose smile and voice were even bigger and louder than her behind. She was a kind woman who gave me cordial with sugar and water and food colouring, which I hated, and fried chicken, which I loved. Daddy took me to the planetarium while I was in London, but I don't know why. I really wanted to go to Madame Tussauds. But of course, I was enraptured. I saw all the stars and planets, Orion's belt and a full eclipse. And when I turned to look at my father, who I wanted to share my wonder, he of course had fallen asleep. He snored gently, his hat tipped down in front of his face. I resent that hat now, even though in my memory he is always, always wearing it. I hate that hat because it covers a face I can no longer bring to mind. Mam's memories of my father seem to be even more indistinct than mine. Mam tells me that I look like him, but how would I know? He was much, much older than her, I think. I don't know exactly how much older, but it is likely he was well into his 50s when I was born, compared to my mother's tender 37. I am not surprised she expected she could do better, even with the kind of multicoloured family she had in tow, a sight far less common then than it is now. But now I am supposed to be a grown-up. I am aware of his continu continuing absence still. I am a 40-something who still craves what she never had, a father to sit at the head of the table, a man who can be trusted. I am also old enough to ask my mother for the truth about their relationship. But Mam is not a woman to be approached casually. Those years bringing up her family alone have hewn her rock hard, and when she does offer up some precious information, it is sometimes something that I don't want to hear. True, it is sometimes something that I do want to hear, but, is but it is almost never a straight answer. Mam's version and my version keep colliding. We build up to the sensitive stuff slowly, but still but horns. Was my dad very short? Oh yes, only five foot four. And was he kind when you met him? It depends what you mean by kind. But when he didn't pay your maintenance, your brother said, never mind ma'am, we'll manage, we've got Katie, he's missing out. No, Mick replies, along with surprising and unasked for gems of information. These have enough cheek sparkle to keep me hooked. You see, I knew when I was a little girl that my daddy hadn't completely left me. And a little of the middle-aged me still believes that, even though Cyril has been dead for about 35 years. Despite the arrival and departure of two stepfathers in quick succession after his death, despite hardly ever seeing him in life, and despite hearing his name only rarely mentioned, and then always uttered by mam through a scowl, I know he was still around, and if not close, then he was never too far away, if Jamaica was not too far away. And if me and Mam didn't know where he was sometimes, it was likely that he was even closer than Jamaica. And crucially, he would be well within saving Katie distance. For I might need him at any moment, and then he would appear, sweeping his khaki princess into his arms, saving his best until last, like in books. And this was the most important thing. I learned that by sheer force of will, I could come how, somehow keep him by. I just had to try on, keep on trying, had to hang on. For if I relaxed for a minute, a second, I might forget him, and then he would be gone. For me, our household's father-shaped hull was a constant presence, like the regular beat of background music. But it now feels as if my brothers and I trod carefully around the place a man we felt should have been there, busy making choices for us, protecting us. I suspect we just made do with ma'am, taking her endless work for granted, as if she on her own was a poor substitute for the perfect whole family we should have been. That is, until an old photograph or the smell of hair oil, any memory at any moment can trigger the presence of my terminally absent father. When this happens, and it still does, the private music of my loss will drown out the everyday bustle of my everyday life, reducing me to tears or driving me to speechless anger with its melancholic urgency. So when my daddy actually did die, 
It was like a second death to me. Or perhaps it was rather that his death had never happened at all. A voice on the telephone, which only a few days before had told me that my father was very ill. Well, it seemed days to the eight-year-old me, but time was so malleable then. A maths lesson lasted a day, whereas English ran for only ten minutes or so. <laughs> this voice now said, your father is dead. It was a stranger's voice with a heavy Jamaican accent. Mam said it was my uncle, my father's brother, but to me it could have been anyone. I suppose I should go to his funeral, I said to Mam, prompted by a feeling no one articulated, but nevertheless weighed down on me. Was it duty? And why this feeling? Toward a father who, through all that he had done, or rather failed to do, had demonstrated absolutely that he hadn't known the meaning of the word. But Mam was typically to the point. It's a bit late to play the dutiful daughter now. And that was the last we spoke of him for years. But then... She didn't know that I'd been playing the dutiful daughter for years. My reaction to my mum's father denial was to turn my small shards of recollections into something else, a sense memory, a feeling of him. He felt to me then like the scratchy part of the washing up sponge, the smell of black and white pomade and the hard woolly fabric of fusty, med fusty smelling men's suits when I brushed against them in charity shops. There are some things that I choose to forget. Like how, on the few occasions that we talked face to face, he looked at me with the eyes, the de with eyes, the details of which I can no longer describe. As I answered his questions, he would seem to only half listen to what I said. And while I talked, he rolled his eyeballs away and chewed slightly on the side of his mouth, a mouth which seemed perpetually to be in motion. These details hardly impinge, though, because my instinct has never been to forget seize the present, leave the dead to the past. Rather, it is to keep safe my recollections and my fantasies, so that these sad baubles are maintained and polished, picked over, and in the repetition of the conscious act, regularly renewed. For I know this to be true. What survives of us is love. The borderline of being and not being is pleased by memory. A heartbeat, his pulse, is neither here nor there. Thank you.